Hi everybody, you're watching the MATLAB Simulink Racing Lounge, part two of our nice series about vehicle modeling. And I'm super glad that Ed is still on board. Hi Ed, how are you doing? Hi Christoph, good, and you? Ah, very good. I'm looking forward to the second part of our series. Um, let's move to the agenda right away. What did we cover last video? Number one, what are we going to cover in that video? Um, I'm just handing it over to you. Excellent. So, as you mentioned, we covered before an equation-based approach with Simulink in the first episode. Mm -hmm. Today, in this episode, what we're going to cover is modeling vehicle systems with the powertrain blocks. And it is a data-driven approach as opposed to equation-based. Later on, coming soon, we're going to talk about Simscape and also Simscape multibody. Again, no worries. We will show you a lot of models. Um, we will put everything on file exchange. So, no need to rebuild models. We will share it with you. And a second comment I have at that point, Powertrain block set is an add-on to Simulink. Um, Ed will touch that, so it's not a completely new tool. It's just an extension of Simulink. And I think Ed is going to show you what Powertrain block set is and what it can do for you. Absolutely. And as you said, all the models will be provided. Right. So sit back, relax. <laughs> and what I want to show here is one of the models that I put together with the Powertrain block set. Right. And this is what we would end up with at mm -hmm. the end of this session. So. This is a conventional vehicle model that models a vehicle mm -hmm. with a combustion engine. And one of the things that I want to start by showing is some of the information that you can get from these models. You can right. actually visualize the maps for engine speed and the actual torque output of the engine. And you can change these parameters and maps to fit your custom application. Right. And you can also get a lot of information based on whatever data you have, even for fuel mass flow mm -hmm. and also the torque and speed of an engine. It sounds super interesting. So bear with us for 20 to 25 minutes and we will walk you through the process of setting up a model in Powertrain Blockset. We're going to do some software demos with the Powertrain Blockset and then we'll summarize our key points as well. Sounds great. So as Christoph mentioned, the Powertrain Blockset is an add-on to Simulink capabilities. Mm -hmm. It is built on top of Simulink and the advantage of it is that you can combine both of these platforms to, for your modeling efforts. So Christoph, if, if you look at this plot here on the mm -hmm. screen, uh, you can see that the powertrain block set is great when you have a lot of data, so it can be used for data-driven modeling mm -hmm. and also for analysis because it can provide relatively high fidelity results. Simulink, on the other hand, it's more of an equation-based approach and I would recommend it more to be used in design stages, you know, when you're beginning. But know that Simulink can also be used for analysis. If you have right. a very high fidelity model that you've built through the months and years in Simulink, right. you can get pretty good results for analysis from that. Cool. So the advantage of these two is, again, that you can combine them. Right. What I will take from that slide is Simulink is to, to start in early stages of the design. And um, if I have the equations, I can set up the Simulink model. For powertrain blocks, I need a bit more data, and it's for analyzing systems that I already have. Um, but I'm not worried at all because powertrain block set is on top of Simulink. So even if a component would be missing in powertrain block set, one could set it up in Simulink and can use these tools in conjunction. That, that's exactly. great. Exactly. Yep. Excellent. Yep, so some of the advantages mm -hmm. of the powertrain blocks, it was built on top of Simulink. It provides the ability to customize your blocks with test data that mm -hmm. users may have. Yep. And you can also represent the operation of a single component right. with a single block. So before in Simulink, we were using a subsystem of many blocks. Yeah. Now you can just use a single block. And again, it is also supported, the powertrain block set for automatic code generation. Nice. Now, if the users are looking for well-documented, open and reconfigurable models, the powertrain block set is a great choice. Also, if the users have access to a lot of test data, powertrain block set is a great choice. And finally, the powertrain block set can also decrease the number of blocks in a model right. while maintaining certain degree of fidelity. I think a very good example here is an internal combustion engine. If you want to model the entire um, thermodynamics, uh, mechanical properties, all the processes happening there, you would need uh, dozens of Simulink blocks. I would say in the powertrain block set, use an engine block, uh, parameterize it with the data available and you're good to go. Correct. All right, so another important aspect about the powertrain block set that we have to keep in mind is that it offers a variety of component options. And what I mean by that is, for example, for to represent engine operation, you can start with the most basic type of blocks, and these are called mapped blocks. Mm -hmm. So you can see, you know, they usually use lookup tables mm -hmm. or maps. But you can also model the details and dynamics of an engine, whether it's compression ignited 
or Spark Ignited. Spark. So for this demo, we're going to stick to the map version of the blocks. And you can configure uh, a lot of different aspects for the operation of the engine, like the power, the air mass flow rate, the mm -hmm. fuel flow rate, the temperature, the efficiency, right. and even the emission aspects of the engine. Also, for transmissions, we have a variety of options. You can have continuously variable transmissions, dual clutch transmissions, or in this case, in our models, what we're gonna use is just a discrete manual transmission. Again, in this models, I created the shift logic for my transmission using state flow, mm -hmm. so that's a toolbox that is an add-on to Simulink. Right. And another piece of information that people may need access to is shift maps mm -hmm. for the transmission. So determining at what speed and accelerator pedal position the transmission would shift gears. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, those are the main components that I'm gonna touch in my demo, but mm -hmm. again, I have a lot of other components like the vehicle dynamics, tires, and also driveline that I would like to cover in the demos here. So we can start very simple with mm -hmm. the glider. And we saw the glider in the first episode of this series. Right. And here what we're doing is we're adding another degree of complexity. We can add wheels and brakes mm -hmm. to our vehicle dynamics. So I'm gonna start here with the vehicle dynamics system. Okay, so from the previous episode, we saw that the vehicle dynamics or the glider mm -hmm. was represented by doing a summation of forces, right. many different blocks. In this case, all of that is summarized here mm -hmm. in the vehicle body block. And I touch on the aspect that these blocks are open-ended and also reconfigurable. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is you can actually um, explore these blocks. So for example, if you look under the mask, you mm -hmm. can actually customize some of the aspects of right. this block if you really want to get to that level. Right, but or again, you benefit from the block, you trust the MathWorks engineers and developers that this was implemented correctly and you just use it. So you have the freedom to choose. Exactly, so a lot of freedom when it comes to this. And again, what I'm doing here is just using some of the parameters that I have. I customize these blocks and then I just plug them in my model. So nice. a lot of simplification here, just one block to represent the vehicle dynamics. Nice. Here, what I'm doing is representing the tires of the vehicle. So mm -hmm. the front tires and the rear tires, right. this only models longitudinal dynamics. So Well, which is fair. You, you need to start at a certain point. And exactly. as we see it here, the tire model is referencing to the magic formula approach. And Correct. Yep. So it can be parameterized using different uh, tire models. Um, in that case, we choose a pretty simple approach, Pacheca magic formula. The good thing is we have developed a tool for you um, to obtain the magic formula coefficients um, from tire test data. So we ref reference to the TTC from Calspan. Um, this is another piece of software that we are going to share with you in another video and also on file exchange. So this will allow you to, to obtain the coefficients B, C, D and E from your tire test data. And I think bit by bit, we are really equipping you with all the, all the things you need to set up a vehicle model. All right, so we cover the wheels, the vehicle dynamics, right. and again, here in this subsystem, we're just gonna see a driver mm -hmm. where we have a PID taking the error between the reference speed, the vehicle speed, and it outputs the braking and actual torque commands that we would desire. Nice. Again, if we run this model, this is a, a drive cycle that, that in reality is about 600 seconds, but this model can actually run probably in probably less than five, five seconds, seconds, so yep. relatively quick. And you can also evaluate the results by comparing the reference speed mm -hmm. to the speed that you're getting out of the model. And here I can say that my model is actually meeting the drive cycle in an adequate manner. Absolutely. And another thing to remind the teams or the users is that they can customize these models to work with yep. an input that fits their needs, whether it's a lap time yeah. or a drive cycle. Exactly. All right, so if we move to our next model, I wanna uh, show a battery electric mm -hmm. vehicle. So how can you model a, an electric powertrain with the powertrain block right. set? And I wanna start here with the motor. Mm -hmm. So the driver is actually providing an accelerator pedal position to the motor. Mm -hmm. And you see that this is much cleaner, a lot less blocks yeah. than uh, what we had in the past with Simulink. Mm -hmm. And what I'm doing here is first predetermining the torque envelope for operation of the motor. Right. And I scale that by the driver demand given by the accelerator's pedal position. Mm -hmm. And that comes in as my torque command. So this battery voltage is something that comes from the battery model, mm -hmm. from the battery block. 
And this motor speed is something that I'm calculating by the linear relationship between vehicle speed and the motor speed. So I have all these inputs and this block actually gives me the battery load that actually goes to the battery system mm -hmm. and also the torque output from that motor. Um, Ed, a so quick question about the battery. In, in that model, are you using the battery modeling approach that we introduced in the first video of the series or is the powdering block set um, providing you a, a block for batteries here? That's a great question. I'm using the block that is provided by yep. the powertrain block set. So I'm going to get into the details of that block in just a few seconds. Thanks. So here, you know, you have the ability to parameterize this motor uh, to work with whatever speeds and torques you may have. Mm -hmm. And my recommendation would be to start again with some defaults that can meet right. the requirements of the user and then parameterize that based on test data that you may have available later on. Great. So if we go to the battery system mm -hmm. here, this is the block that is provided by nice. uh, the toolbox. So again, the load current that comes from, from the motor subsystem, uh, an ambient temperature input, and we get the output voltage for the battery. Right. Okay, so here you can definitely characterize the efficiency and also the number of cells or the chemistry of the battery. Right. In this case, I decided to change the number of cells in series and cells in parallel to meet my drive cycle right. in this model. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And again, the rear differential, it's before we had some formulas modeling the drive line. Now we just have an open differential block. Mm -hmm. So that simplifies things. And all I worried about here was just putting the gear ratio in the final drive. That's the only thing changed. And then that torque that comes from the motor to the rear differential passes through an axle compliance. And this block, mm -hmm. what it does is it models a spring damper system, pretty much like a shaft would right. be, or an axle. And then it goes to the wheels and vehicle dynamic subsystems that we had before. So these didn't cool. change from the previous model. Nice. So that's one of the advantages of these models. You can build up the complexity. You can start with your very first models and add different components to those. Perfect. That's great. Um, have we run that model already? Or do, do we want to give it a go? And then see. Let's run it. Yep. So yeah, again, the drive cycle about 600 seconds, yeah. but this model runs relatively quick. Nice. Uh, I think it runs in less than five seconds. Nice. So there it is. And we can visually inspect the high level results. Right. So am I meeting my drive cycle or not? In this case, we are. And right. these models also can provide a lot more detailed information for exactly. each one of the components, the battery, the motor, and uh, also the gearbox. I was just about to comment that. Um, so we, we let that model run and we show one default plot. Um, but you could attach a scope to pretty much any signal in that model. You could monitor currents, you could monitor forces, um, compliance on your Excel system, um, information about battery. So you, you, you have an insight to everything. It's based on Simulink and um, you can save signals to your workspace, to MATLAB. So this, these models are super accessible and super easy to work with. All right. So now the last model that I have that I want to show is a conventional vehicle. So how can we model a uh, combustion engine? Right. And again, the driver subsystem and you know my drive line didn't mm -hmm. actually change. I still have a rear differential mm -hmm. with an axle and the wheels and the vehicle dynamics. So what actually changed was the powertrain. Right. The different components producing the propulsion of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. So here in this case, I have an accelerator pedal position coming from the driver subsystem mm -hmm. to the engine. And what I have here is just uh, a major block, the mapped spark ignited right. engine. So here, what I do is convert from accelerator pedal position to a torque command mm -hmm. based on the characteristics of the engine. And if I open this block, I can customize a lot of different things. Right. So my recommendation for the teams or the users mm -hmm. would be to start working with the defaults characterize that and then parameterize your components based of, on test data that you may, may get later on. Yeah, I know that a lot of teams have access to a, a dyno. So this is exactly um, where you obtain all the input data to, to parameterize your, your engine here. And as said, as, as Ed said, start with the defaults and add data as you go. All right, so if we move on to the last different component that mm -hmm. is a transmission, mm -hmm. here what we have is an ideal fixed gear transmission. Right. So. I, I took care of the shifting logic with mm -hmm. state flow. That's a different toolbox. Yep. And then I don't have a clutch model in this uh, vehicle system. So what I did was 
I implemented some logic mm -hmm. to model that clutch operation. So right. whenever the brake is pressed and there's no torque input, then the transmission and the engine decouple. Cool. So I provide those inputs to this transmission block and I can get a lot of information from the transmission mm -hmm. block. Also, the engine speed, which is used for feedback, and then the speed output, which I can get the torque output from. Ooh. And that is the torque that starts going down the drive line to oh. the differential mm -hmm. and to the wheels. Cool. So the only component you haven't modeled um, as an actual component is the clutch. So what you've done is a, a logical clutch, which, which is a very smart simplification here. Um, this is also the, the freedom that Simulink gives you. Well, set the modeling depth on your own. And if you can model simple, model simple. Absolutely, simplicity is right. always good to start. Right. And you know, with this block, you have a lot of different things that you can uh, parameterize. For example, the number of gears yep. and each one of the gear ratios, and even the efficiencies. Right. So and this is it's up only to the about to fill uh, those gaps. Yeah, right. And this is about reading the data sheet of your transmissions uh, of the transmission you have in mind. Absolutely. Right. So again, if we run this model, it should take. This one takes a little longer, mm -hmm. but it's still much less than ten seconds. Nice. Ed, well, th these demos have been quite impressive, uh, great complexity um, with a decent amount of blocks. Can we try to summarize the key takeaways of today's episode a bit? Absolutely, let's do that. So the powertrain components, as, as we mentioned, are built on Simulink. So right. that gives a lot of flexibility. And these models are highly open and very configurable. There's a lot of documentation available mm -hmm. for how this works and how you can make appropriate modifications to these right. if necessary. Also is worth remembering that the powertrain blocks and components are data driven. So right. your uh, responsibility here is to parameterize those components to whatever test data you have available. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, I think a recommended workflow is starting with the default that is already provided with the components if you don't have access to some of that data. And there's many options available, uh, as we mentioned, for example, for engine options, for transmissions, and even differentials as well, and vehicle right. bodies and all that. Right. So a lot of flexibility offered with this tool. And the last thing I want to highlight is that the powertrain is supported also for co-generation if you need to do hardware testing or hardware deployment later on. I think that that's a very good summary of today's episode. Um, there will be more videos. So next video will be about Simscape. Um, the keyword there is physical modeling, so actually modeling physical components. And if you feel that's interesting for you, stay tuned. Um, can, you, can you try to summarize next episode in one phrase? What, what are we going to do? We're going to do Simscape, physical modeling, and it can be very intuitive and a lot of fun. So stay tuned. Intuitive. Perfect. Um, well, thanks very much. Thank you, Christoph. Um, it was a pleasure to record with you. And towards the end of the episode, you're used to that. We, we are super interested in your feedback. Um, if you would send us emails or if you would contact us on social media, for example, Facebook, that would be great because that's the foundation of our support. The more, you the more you share your questions, the more you share your problems, the better our support can be. So please make use of, of that tool. Um, another link for the sake of completeness, um, find all Racing Lounge episodes under mathworks.com slash Racing Lounge. And in that ecosystem, you will, will also find a link to the software offer. And if you do use our software, um, it would, we would be glad if you use the MathWorks logo on your car or on your reports. Thanks for watching. See you next time.